Hello. Today, we will review what we have studied so far in the first week of this course. We have covered over 2000 years of architectural history. We started off with the Indus Valley Civilization, notable for its rigid gridiron planning, for its modular construction, for its elaborate drainage systems, and a number of seals that were found which might or might not represent writing, but certainly contain some kind of pictograms. The Indus Valley Civilization does not have any successors in terms of its architecture, at least not directly. With the decline of the civilization sometime in the middle of the second millennium BCE, the people who built this civilization moved into the countryside and this standardization of architecture on a massive scale that the Indus had disappeared. By standardization, we mean that the Indus Valley had bricks which were of a defined size, as you see here. It had weights and measures that were used across its entire expanse of thousands of kilometers. People built houses according to certain plans and modules. There was a very geometric understanding of how construction worked. The structures that were built were not just private dwellings, but also civic and public. Indus Valley seems to have operated as a republic, but unfortunately, we do not know enough about it. What we do know is that there is an incredible sophistication, both of engineering and architecture, of building in brick and of laying out urban settlements. There is no experimentation on this scale on the Indian subcontinent prior to this civilization. And therefore, it is suspected that this is more closely connected with Central Asia, with the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex or BMAC, or is connected with the Bronze Age civilizations on the Iranian plateau. And the Iranian connection with India for architecture will persist all the way into the 18th century. The next big wave of architectural innovation comes with the movement in migration of Sanskrit speaking peoples popularly called the Indo-Europeans or Indo-Aryans who come in from the West and bring with them cultures and technologies that have not been seen on the Indian subcontinent before. They come with chariots, they are pastoralists, they have the spoked wheel and their mode of worship involves praying to deities in the sky, in the heavens, and this mode of prayer is enacted through ritual sacrifices. And for these sacrifices, what they need are altars that they build. And the altars are not simple square altars, but depending on the kind of sacrifice and the kinds of favors that are sought from different gods, they have altars in the shape of birds, in perfect circles, as you can see in this picture here, and also in a variety of other shapes that mimic other animals, such as a tortoise, the kurma. In the slide above, you can see a re replication, a recreation of all the implements that were used for one of these sacrifices. All these tools and the altars are described in great detail in a body of texts called the Shulba Sutras, where the sizes of bricks are given, how you arrange them is laid out, and it is the Shulba Sutras which form the basis of what will later get called Vedic mathematics, because these are geometrically precise arrangements. In fact, it is believed that if your prayers are imperfect or if your measurements and proportions are imperfect, the sacrifices you make on these altars do not reach the heavens, do not reach the gods, and are rendered ineffective. While this Vedic civilization is spreading across India, there exist, as you see right here, a number of autochthonous cults that worship serpent deities, the Nagas, and also forest deities, the Yakshas. 
and these cults will eventually be absorbed into what will get called Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism because as these three major Indic religions evolve, all these autochthonous deities and cults are absorbed within them. You also do have in the second and first millennium BCE, particularly in the Indian Peninsula, a number of societies that are building or putting together megaliths. Megaliths are nothing more than architectural forms created by putting together enormous boulders. While we do not completely understand the technology is used to move boulders weighing you know, several tons into place, what we do know is that these are largely stone age societies. The elements that make up these buildings or these shelters are not finely tooled or carved, but it is yet an achievement to move these into place given their massive size and weight. You find these spread across Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra and into Madhya Pradesh and then at several stray locations across the country. Again with the megaliths we know very little about the society that builds them and we do not have any other expressions of these societies other than ash mounds. Where we start having early history and early historic architecture in India is with the advent of the Mauryas across the eastern Gangetic plain in places in modern day Bihar where you have Chandragupta Maurya, the great Mauryan emperor make contact with the Indo-Greek kingdoms that have arisen on the western side. Now while you have a lot of Indo-Greeks in the wake of Alexander's conquests of Asia settling down in what is present day Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Mauryan empire is also expanding in that direction and you have several diplomatic, military and cultural contacts. The great achievements of the Achaemenid empire of Persia which was made big by emperors such as Cyrus and Darius these find their way into the Indian plain. The three big achievements which we've seen with the Achaemenids are the construction of large palaces, monumental inscriptional writing and also setting up royal edicts in various places. We also see that the Achaemenids build with their new tools enormous cave sites carved into the living rock. All of these will be borrowed by the uh, Mauryas and you will have all across India with Chandragupta's grandson these Mauryan columns which resemble the ruined columns at Persepolis. All of them will have monumental writing that display a royal edict and many forms of Persian kingship will find their way in India. These columns will mark authority, territory and religious benevolence. These are erected across India in various places as Ashoka embraced Buddhism and thought that the message of the Buddha could be spread with these columns. There is even one in Lumbini in Nepal which is the birthplace of Gautam Buddha. What you also do find in this period from Ashoka onwards are monumental inscriptions that tell you about when a building was built, who built it and for whom it was built. And the early inscriptions you find are at the Barabar caves in Bihar where you have again emulating the Achaemenids cave architecture in living rock for the first time in which you see the replication of architectural forms that are made of timber originally such as in the Lomas Rishi cave where the curvilinear roof depicted on the entrance is a translation of what a wooden hut would have looked like. Inside this cave you have one longitudinal hall at the end of which is placed the replica of a cave. This cave was built for a sect called Ajivika 
Ajivika ascetics in the monsoons, they were itinerant and in the monsoons they required respite from the rains and they would come and stay here in the rains and their teacher probably lived inside that hut and what you have on the outside is a gathering space for all the ascetics. This idea that a teacher or a holy man who embodied some kind of connection with the divine would live inside a hut which provided him shelter would also be picked up by Buddhism at the same time. In fact, at the cave at Kondivte, which you see here, what you have is similar to the Lomas Rishi cave at Barabar. You have inside the cave a representation of a timber hut. Look at the windows with the lattices as though they were built in timber. Of course, this being a Buddhist cave has inside not a living holy man, but a stupa, which would come to represent the Buddha in a later period. This idea is best expressed on one of the tornas or gateways at the Sanchi Stupa, where you see an embodiment of the divine in the shape of an altar. So look at the carving on the other side. There is an altar which is sheltered with a small timber hut. There is a railing on top that signifies that it is marked off, it's bounded because it's holy. There is a crown kept on the square altar. Through the altar grows a tree and the tree has an umbrella on top. A number of these attributes such as the crown and the umbrella were royal honorifics and because the Buddha came from a royal birth even after enlightenment references to him were royal references. The crown and the umbrella for example became to symbolize the presence of the Buddha. So did the tree which not only represented a vertical axis to the divine but it also represented the tree under which the Buddha was enlightened. The square altar and the railing were something that marked the tree a lot of times and all of these symbols together came to represent the presence of the Buddha. But notice all of them are housed in a timber hut. What you have on the closer side of the column is actually two kinds of divine or semi-divine figures housed inside huts. One is the autochthonous Naga cult that I was talking of. So you have a multi-hooded serpent, a Naga Devata who is housed inside a hut because the divine needs to be housed. And similarly, very close by here, you have a living master, a holy man, a preceptor who is also housed inside a hut and people are paying obeisance to him and praying. Notice that the whole column is bounded by architectural elements such as railings and columns. Over time, particularly around the 2nd century BC and onwards, the stupa comes to signify the holy presence of the Buddha and later on it is picked up for a brief phase by other religions. So for example, what you have at the bottom is from Mathura, the depiction of a Jain stupa with a torna and the railing and so on. On top you have a Indo-Greek influenced stupa in Northwest India. But notice that the vocabulary used by Buddhism and Jainism is exactly the same, the architectural vocabulary. And we shall see this entwinement of different religions using the same architectural language time and again. As the stupa becomes central to Buddhist forms of worship and as the Buddhist monastic establishment evolves and becomes more elaborate, what you find across India, most notably in the western Deccan, are these enormous sites which have caves carved into the living rock, the caves being of two major types called Chaityas and Viharas. Chaityas are these apsidal halls which replicate wooden architecture inside the rock and have a stupa at one end where monks would pray, meditate 
and carry out exercises and what you have other than the chaityas are what are called the viharas which are these small rectangular cells in which monks would reside. And it was not just monks who built these caves, you had professionals hired by monks and a lot of them were paid for by traveling groups which used to halt at these cave sites. And therefore what you have are cave sites in networks, not just in isolated ways. Buddhism very quickly evolves into a form of temple worship in which the simple hut that houses the Buddha, that houses the stupa becomes a multi-storied mansion. After all, royal patronage of a religion would ensure that huts are transformed into palaces. This is the famous Jataka set in the Jetavana garden where coins are used to pave over the grounds of the garden. But the Buddha is in a Gandhakuti or a sweet fragrant hut that is in the garden. And this hut is represented as a hut on the terrace of a multi-storied wooden mansion. This idea that a hut is not adequate but you need a multi-storied mansion for housing the divine becomes important both in Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism. This relief is from Kanganhalli, a recently discovered stupa site in northern Karnataka. The next logical step is instead of carving replicas of multi-storied mansions inside of living rock, it is easy to carve huts inside living rocks but not multi-storied mansions you start having freestanding temples very early. The temple of to on top, which is temple 17 at Sanchi, we do not know exactly what deity or divinity was housed in there. We do know that it is built in the first half of the 5th century CE and what it replicates is a cave with a porch in front, an example of which we'll see shortly after. And at the bottom, within 50 years, is the temple at Devgarh in modern day Madhya Pradesh where you have the same idea of a cella, a sanctum being a cubical cave completely man-made which has a multi-storied tower on top that represents a multi-storied palace. Also what happens in the temple at Devgarh is that the divinity housed inside starts finding manifestation in physical form on the walls on the outside of the temple. These kinds of temples were thought of as shelters for the gods that were placed on an altar. This idea that the temple now has to manifest itself from an unmanifest state is something that goes hand in hand with the thinking of this time where not only in architecture but also in sculpture, in all forms of thinking, there is an explosion of reality. From the contemplative Upanishads, you have the Puranas, the great epics. You have a complete manifestation of the divine spilling over into the human world. This is done by expanding horizontally, as you see at the bottom, with one Shivalinga manifesting itself in many directions but also vertically where you see similar kinds of ideas expressed with statues such as the Sadashiva at Parel where you have in a vertical axis the deity Shiva who is expanding to fill up the universe in all directions and also a rock relief from Elora where what used to be a linga divine in an unmanifest columnar shape now is becoming manifest where Shiva himself is appearing. These ideas that you enclose a horizontal sacrificial altar but also a vertical axis is what causes the shape of the Hindu temple to evolve in ways that it will. This idea of manifesting, unfolding, exploding in every direction yet containing within it a marked off area that is a homology of the entire cosmos. 
and therefore all these ideas of a sacrificial altar, of a cave, of a shelter, of a vertical axis, of a multi-storied palace and of performing sacrifices is embodied, it comes together in the Hindu temple. You have on your right a cave at Udaigiri built sometime in the first century BCE which actually is a cave with a portico in front not unlike the temple that will come a few hundred years later the freestanding temple 17 at Sanchi. What you have on your left is from the 6th century CE at Mahabalipuram a multi-storied mansion built as a shelter for divinity. The two major types of temples we've looked at have been what are popularly called the North Indian and the South Indian temple but correctly and technically known as the Latina temple on the further side and the Kutina temple on this side. The Latina temple is marked by vertical bands that connect it whereas the Kutina temple is marked by horizontal bands. Both of them embody the idea of a multi-storied palace but there are significant differences. Most notably in the Kutina temple you can still see the kutas or edicules that make up the horizontal bands of the palace whereas in the Latina temple they have been compressed to such a degree that all you see are strong verticals. The three major forms of the Latina temple of the North Indian temple are the Shekhari which has cascading spires, the Kalinga which has a very curious curvilinear shape and the Bhumija where you have strong bands along the four cardinal sides connected by small edicules laid out in horizontal tiers. What is important is to note that it takes almost four to five hundred years for these regional idioms, these regional styles to evolve and this is the great age of temple building where the biggest temples in India are built between the 8th and the 12th century. Now for an exercise let us look up examples of all the topics we have covered in the learning sessions so far and find examples of relevant sites and buildings that have not been covered by us in class. Following this we shall also have a list of terms that have been learnt, the meanings for which you will have to write as an exercise.